Am I losing it? I probably never did. I, I probably never did. I'm just faking it. Uh, sadly, maybe for one or two, uh, we're not going to have a service tonight on the Noah because I was at the hospital until midnight with my son in emergency. And uh, Isaac, and he, uh, they think he might have gone straight to the head of the class, right, to type 1 diabetes. So they took more blood, more tests, they hooked him up with a bag of IV or whatever, and lots of people came in to see him. I was very, the doctor was very nice. It's going to hook him up with an endocrinologist quickly to find out what's going on. So I'm just a wet noodle. So you're old. Cool. <laughs> so viejo? <laughs> he laughs. He laughs. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. So there's the insert that we're going to do for each of these books. Now, as I said, at the back of the church, there's the 27 books of the New Testament. And uh, so next week we're into uh, Luke. If there is a verse or a passage or something in the book that you want me to go over, uh, over the next 25 more weeks... Uh, just jot it down across from the book itself, and I'll look at that, we'll do that. There is, you'll see it in your bulletin here, the accessible bus we're looking to, they're looking to get. And there's a, on the June the 15th, there's a, a fundraiser for that and a meal, nice meal, at the Legion. And here in Beaver Harbor on the 12th at 7 o'clock at night, there's going to be a meeting to discuss having an accessible bus for the Charlotte, for this region, for people who, who need it. I think it's a wonderful idea. I do. And there is a bus to purchase, right? Well, we're looking into that right now. Yeah, we're so it's... Information. Things, are in, things are in progress. Uh, next week we'll do communion and... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Janet Fullerton. Uh, we have a new neighbor, Tom Yang and his wife. And they bought the property right next to the church here, and they were out clearing the woods the other day, and they're likely to, to attend here. And uh, they'll build, they're just trying to decide whether they want to build a house up on the rocks or down below. Uh, seem like very nice people come from Windsor, Ontario, and he's trying to move his sailboat from Vancouver all the way around to come up into here. So. What's that? Suez Canal. He'd have to go through the Suez Canal. <laughs> Maybe the Panama Canal would be closer. <laughs> right? I've been through there four times. It'll be a little tight with a tiny little boat. But, you know, that's the way it is. We are, now, we know that you had an anniversary, right? So Debbie and Gary had an anniversary this past week. And there are other people that have anniversaries. I don't know when, you don't have to tell me, but I thought, as we get started this morning, to help myself wake up from last night's fun fest of emergency room visit, um, that uh, we would sing the uh, happy anniversary song for everyone in the next little while. And I've gone way back in history to uh, Fred and Wilma Flintstone. But if you haven't, I mean, if you've seen the Flintstones, right? And and, and it, it, uh, it's it, this the first part's pretty slow. It's like happy anniversary, happy anniversary, happy anniversary, happy anniversary. Poor cheerful folks are still a happy anniversary, but be careful of us still a happy anniversary. Oh, happy anniversary. So you must have remembered. You've heard it, maybe, if you were. Were you saying you're old you too? Did my wife's work inside of I did! I did! I went to, it was Uncle May's, right? Yeah. And I sang to Amanda the anniversary song out loud, and she shrunk and turned about eight shades of red, and then the other staff started singing it! 
I thought it was great. Best day of your life. Best day of your life. <laughs> so if you want me to come to your workplace and embarrass you, I am your guy. I can do that. Okay, let's let's do this here. Happy anniversary, happy anniversary, happy anniversary, happy anniversary. Laura, careful, don't spill it. Happy anniversary, but be careful you don't spill it. Happy anniversary. So good to be 
in the house of the Lord this morning. And uh, I want to invite Lorene to come up and read the scripture for today. And uh, as well, uh, she has a testimony. Yeah. I'm going to give my testimony, then I'm going to read the word. I have much to thank God for. In 2019, I got a phone call. In October the 19th, my daughter-in-law had died. We went out to Alberta, Bonneville. On the 21st, I wound up in the hospital. Spent three weeks there. They had to rush me to the Royal Alexander. I had bowel cancer. And I never really got to see my kids. Just saying, you know, to be with them. Uh, I got up for the service, which I thank God for. When they did the operation, they came in and told me, they said, do you want it uh, done now or home? I said, I'm doing it here. You found it, I'll have it done here. So you're away from your family, you're away from your kids because they're all together, which they needed to be, and your husband was there, and yet he wanted to be with his son, which is understandable. So I told him to go. Go be with your children, you know, be with Herbie and things, because they need you too. And uh, so on the Sunday that I was going to be operated on, he didn't get back. He just got in the door when they came and said that they were going to operate on me. And uh, they marked you and everything just for your boss, whether it's going to come out or rest or whatever they're going to do. And my husband said to me, he said, are you reading it? I said, no. I said, why should I read something when God's already taken care of it? Amen. So I said, I wasn't worried. Of course, he, he, he doesn't understand me most of the time when it comes to the Lord, but that's all right. But um, I went down to the operating room. And they said to me on the, at the table, on the table, they said, uh, do you have anything to say? I said, yes. I said, I'm going in good, coming up better, and Jesus is doing the operation. And he has. Uh, that's been five years ago. Here, just a few weeks ago, I've been having problems with my right leg. It's been paining. Uh, they even gave me time all three. I'd be taking two of them. Nothing worked. So I just went up to the hospital. Uh, that was on a Friday. On Tuesday, I wound up in the hospital again thinking I was having a heart attack. And uh, but during that time, that process of taking tests and everything, they found a spot on my leg. Uh, when you go into the emergency room, as we all know, you cannot get in, in there and get into a bed. I got there at 7.30 Tuesday morning. There was not one person in that emergency room. Now, that is God. Because even the paramedic said to me, I can't believe you are the only one here. So I went right in, and the, the nurses and doctors, they were great. Uh, when I was getting ready, they had to move me up to the hallway, which was no big deal, later on. And then the doctor came in and he said, your heart's good, your lungs good, but they found a spot on my leg. I said, okay. He said, would you talk to your doctor? And I said, yes, I will. So I got a hold of my doctor on a Thursday. Friday morning, they called. I was to go in Wednesday and have tests done, which I thought was just a CT scan. But it wasn't. I was down into the nuclear medicine. And they had put dye in my body and all this. And uh, so we went in and they did a full body scan. And then they come back out and said, so we uh, asked me some questions. They had to do another scan. Uh, another full body scan. Plus, they did a C CT scan there. And I had to have my hands up over my head there. And for 20 minutes, felt like more than 20 minutes. And, but anyway, and so I left there at 20 to 3 that afternoon. At quarter after 3, my phone rang. It was the doctor, the specialist, 
in St. John calling for me to have an appointment on June the 10th. Now, we know you can't get into a specialist that fast. I know God is in it. I know God is taking care of it. I don't know what the results are. I don't even care. Because when Jesus doesn't work, he doesn't work. Amen. Amen. So I said, Lord, it's all in your hands. So I have no idea what I'll see on June the 10th, what they'll tell me. But I know that Jesus is in it, and everything is going to be great. So I am not worried about it. I don't care what they say, because I have the faith to know that no matter what they tell me, Jesus has already taken control of it. Amen. So I wanted to give my testimony this morning, because I know a lot of people have been asking how am I feel and everything. I feel great. Yes, once the leg pains, I'm not going to say it doesn't, but my faith is in Jesus. He's the only one that really takes us through everything we go through. No matter how hard the struggle is, he's always there. So I just want to give my testimony this morning, and I'll read the scriptures. Thank you. You're welcome. Mark 1, 40 to 45. Verse 40. And a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him, and falling on his knees before him, and saying, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Verse 41. Moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. Verse 42. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Verse 43. And he sternly warned him and immediately sent him away. Verse 44. And he said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Verse 45. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city but stayed out in unpopulated areas and they were coming to him from everywhere. Thank you, Marie. Thank God and his blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, I've told you before many times the one thing that uh, uh, when I was in uh, Cuba and other Latin American countries is that their services are about three hours long or so, but the first thing they do is they open up the floor to testimony. And every Latin church that I attended and that I've preached in a bunch of them as well, half an hour minimum, minimum half an hour, people standing up to say, what the Lord did for me this week, what God has done for me this week, and it's wonderful. And if you want to give a testimony, I encourage you to do that. Because it's one thing to read something in the paper or see something on the computer, right? But to know one of your sisters or brothers is going through something and, and to hear how God's moving in their lives is, is transformational. It's, it's wonderful. And we should do that. I'm going to go straight now to uh, the Revelation song here. Uh, just as we get going, we know we're going to pray for Lorraine. Uh, also, any of those who know uh, Brian Hooper, he walks around a lot. Clyde. Clyde. Clyde? I'm sorry, you wrote down right. Uh, he's got about two days to live. And so, yeah, he'll be gone. Cancer everywhere. And, uh, and of course, your sister Jean McCumber. Is he the guy that walks back and forth to the store? Uh, down here? No, no that's not him. No, no. He's a Wilcox. And uh, Jean McCumber passed away, and I'll do her graveside committal Friday afternoon. And uh, so we'll be praying for a lot of these people. So let's take a bit of time to, to just worship the Lord before prayer. Father, I thank you for today, and I thank you for each and every person here. I thank you, Lord, for your strength and your power. I thank you for energizing us. I thank you for revealing yourself in and through us and through uh, the things that we encounter and the people that we encounter, Lord. 
And this morning as we worship you, Father, may we glorify your name with all that we do, all that we say, how we act, how we react, Lord. Help us to do that. And Father, if there's something within us that's causing us not to sense your spirit in this place today, which is clearly here, we give you permission to tear it out. Take the walls down. Take the barriers down, Lord. We thank you in the precious name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Worthy is the When I saw your open eyes 
something beautiful I don't deserve it but your grace is perfect today I found a Savior stronger than darkness He takes my fears and I never fear I'm alone I found a Savior to carry more than my secrets to carry love and every burden in my soul I was so lost when I found your love standing against all odds. I know I'll make it through somehow. What was was lost is redeemed, heart once in chains now free, and I am not afraid to testify. and about whether we feel worthy of receiving that grace, Lord. That can we come to you and ask, will you reach out and touch us? Will you reach out and bring a healing? Will you reach out and lift us out of our sorrow or our, our misery, Lord? Or, or try to help us understand what's going on in our lives. Father Mark speaks very clear about that, and that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at the leper, Lord. But there are more things out there than leprosy that we need to come to Jesus about. Father, there's so many people that we've lost, those in hospitals, those who need further tests, Lord. I could go on and on. We've mentioned them. You know their names, Lord, more than I will ever. Father, no doubt there are people out there suffering financially or physically or in relationship, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, Lord. Father, we, we desire that whatever is within us, that you will come and help, that you will come and do a work. And if we have those walls, if we have those barriers, you will tear them down and pour your Spirit's presence within us where it already is. You will make your presence, Holy Spirit, known to us that we might reach out to you, that we might come to our knees before you, Lord. Father, I praise you for this church and those that are coming, and I praise you for the future people that will come here. And I pray and hope that, that the Yang family will, will be welcomed here that will come into this 
place that will be loved here and know that they are accepted here, Lord. And so, Father, as I give this message today, I just ask that you speak to each and every one of us in a powerful but private, personal, intimate way that we would each know decisively that you are speaking to our hearts and our minds and our souls, Lord. I will thank you for this so much more. In the precious, holy name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> we are becoming a multicultural church, which is wonderful. Uh, we have people from Mexico. We have people, Davina, from the Philippines that's here. Um, Tom and his wife will likely come and attend here. Uh, he's from, uh, where's he from? The uh, Taiwan, uh, among other things. And the beautiful thing about a congregation like that is when we represent the face and the makeup of our community, then we're doing good. We're doing God's good things. And we come together and share in our cultures and share in our lives together. Let's take a look at Mark. John, Mark. He was a relative of Barnabas. He was a very important member of the early church. He, obviously, as we will discover, the writer of the Gospel of Mark. His father was Roman. And his mother was Hebrew. They lived in uh, Jerusalem together. Acts chapter 12 and verse 12 tells us this. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, John Mark, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And so wherever John Mark started off his life, people were coming in to pray, people were coming in to, to talk about Yeshua, to talk about Jesus, and he, he was immersed in that. There's a monastery of St. Mark in the old, old city of Jerusalem. Here's a plaque here. It's an inscription that says, This is the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark, the writer of the Gospel. The monastery is a 6th century inscription. What about missions? What about missions for John? Well, he first went on a mission with Paul's first missionary journey. The picture's here, and they went to Cyprus and to some other places. Some really gruesome things happened in Cyprus. And so John Mark, who accompanied Barnabas and the Apostle Paul, um, he turned back. He fled. He left. And when he did that, John had no time for him, or Paul had no time for him at all. Thought he was useless, and he, he was fearful, but he left. On the second missionary journey... Paul wouldn't have John Mark, but Barnabas wanted him. So Barnabas and Paul split ways, and John Mark went with Barnabas on that. They went into a place into Cyprus. Barnabas was bitterly opposed by the Greco-Roman pagans on Cyprus. And in this town, you can see right here, this old town of, uh, of uh, Salamis, he was stoned to death. And so now there's John Mark, or, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and he's, he's wondering what's going on. He sees this guy die. It happened in about 60 AD. And so he heads back again. Eventually he ended up with Paul and traveled quite a bit with Paul. And, uh, Paul, we think, probably led him to the Lord, and uh, he spent a lot of time in Babylon and listened to a lot of what the Apostle Peter was teaching. After the deaths of Peter and Paul, John went to Alexandria. This is what the old city used to look like in Alexandria right now. It looks bigger than Toronto, if you were to look at it today. He established a church there. He became a pastor there. He evangelized there. What about his weaknesses? Because we all have strengths and we all have weaknesses. When they asked me, every church I went to, 
to pastor, and they'd ask me the same question. What are your strengths and what are your weaknesses? They want to know. And I said, they're the same, as you may know. I said, I wear my emotions on my sleeve. And so what's good about that is you know where I'm coming from, right? Because I don't hide it. What's bad about that is you know what I'm <laughs> Right? If I'm a little... I don't hide it very well. I don't play politics very well. And I think that's a better place to be where there's no, no walls. John Mark wrote the gospel that bears his name, no doubt, in about 59. But he had his weaknesses. He left Paul and Barnabas at one point. Here's another one. Mark 14, 51 to 52. A young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen sheet over his naked body. They seized him, but he pulled free of the linen sheet and escaped naked. In that passage, a young man is roused from his sleep by the commotion that was going on with Jesus, he puts a, a sheet around him, he goes out there, they notice that he is close to him and maybe part of this movement, they go to arrest him, they go to grab him, but he is afraid, he's afraid, and so he skips out somehow, leaves the sheet behind, and he flees for his home. The fact that it, this incident is only recorded in the Gospel of Mark, the only place will tell us that this is probably Mark himself telling about what he did and what he could not do. What about as a pastor and an evangelist? Mark was a pastor in Alexandria. He returned there. The traditional gods that people were worshipping were a big problem for him. He tried to tell people about who Yeshua was, who Jesus was. The man that was a normal man, but he was a sensational man, a leader. He was a spiritual man. He was God. And to that end, he was gathered up. They tied a rope around his legs and they dragged him through the city by horse until he died. And he died a martyr as well. Mark illustrates who Jesus is as a person. He illustrates the details of his teachings. And more than that, he presents him in his gospel as a servant. Jesus, the servant who came to serve. Who wrote the gospel of Mark? Well, I think the question is pretty obvious, or the answer is obvious. John Mark is the author of the gospel, but what they say is that he wrote down what the apostle Peter told him. And so most of his gospel is the accounts of the apostle Peter telling about their personal relationship with Jesus, plus he added more to what he knew about. In fact, it was a very hearty and very accurate gospel that about... 60 or 70 percent of Mark is also found in the other synoptic gospels as a source. The Gospel of Mark, written about 65 AD, 31 verses, uh, uh, more than 31, like all but the whole Gospel of Mark, except for 31 verses, is found in Matthew and in Luke. The book was written in Rome when he was there. It includes Jerusalem, Bethany, Mount of Olives, Golgotha, Jer Jericho, Nazareth, Capernaum, uh, Capernaum, and Caesarea Philippi, all these locations that Jesus uh, was moving around with. Two of the most cited passages in Mark are these two, Mark 10, verses 40, or 45 and uh, 45. Uh, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. He came to give a ransom for many. He came as a servant. And the next one, Mark 8 and 34. He summoned the crowd with his disciples, and he said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow him. So final note in Mark's story about Mark himself is that in his writings 
Jesus is buried in the tomb. Now, in the original Gospel of Mark, that's where it ends. There is no resurrection in his Gospel. His Gospel ends with the two women coming to the tomb, seeing the men dressed in white, and, and fleeing in terror to tell Peter and to tell John what's going on. And that's where his Gospel... So later on, I don't know exactly when, someone added to the end of Mark to talk about the resurrection of Yeshua. So let's get to the verse that we want to talk about. And Maureen read it for us earlier. I want to read it one more time. And, and I think that you will see that this applies to all of us in, in different ways. Again, if you want to talk about something in the books that we're going to read, please write that passage or something down uh, at, on the bulletin board. Here we go. Mark chapter 1, verses 40 to 45. And a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him and falling on his knees before him, and saying, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing to be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him and it was cleansed. He sternly warned him and immediately sent him away. He said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone. But show yourself to the priest and give that offering that you need to do. But when he went out to proclaim it freely to spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city and stayed out in unpopulated areas as they were coming to him from everywhere. The commencement of the commencement of this disease is imperceptible. Leprosy appears as a few little white spots on the skin. There's no pain, no inconvenience, no scratching, nothing else, just a few white spots. And over a period of time, they start to spread on your arms and your hands. They're on your nose. Your nose starts to swell and get oversized. You get tumors on the jaw and in your eyes and your ears and so many other places, in your hands and feet. Eventually, parts of your body may actually fall off. So, the law of Leviticus, the law given by Moses, was that if you are a leper, if you contracted leprosy, you could not be anywhere near anyone else. Because if they got within breathing range of you, or touched you in any way, they would be ceremoniously unclean and could not go to temple, could not do other things. So they had to stay in the shadows. This person had been a leper for a very long time, very lonely life. And when he did go out, he had to yell, Unclean! Unclean! I'm unclean! He had to yell this out as loud as he could in his voice so people would know that he's on his way with his leprosy, that he was unclean, that he couldn't be touched or he was going to cause problems for them and it would give them a chance to go away. Now, at one point in the, the account that we read here, the leper is coming into town, to the edge of town. He's screaming, I'm clean, I'm clean, stay away. Jesus is coming down off the mountain. He's been up there for some time giving a probably about five different sermons that the Bible has meshed together into what we call the Sermon on the Mount, but it was five different occasions or so. He's surrounded by his disciples and other followers. He's coming off the mountaintop, right? And this leper comes around the corner, sees him. Unclean! Unclean! What do the people around Jesus do? Just like when you turn the lights on, the cockroaches scatter, don't they? They take off. But Yeshua does not. He walks towards the men. I love these words that he says. And, and a lot of us might be the same way. He says, Master or, or Yeshua or Rabbi, if you are willing, if you are willing you can heal me. If you are willing, you can heal me. And so he's on his knees. He's looking up at the Savior. 
And he's thinking to myself, I am not worthy to be healed. I don't believe that I can be blessed enough to be healed. I'm bad. I've got this sickness. Everyone stayed away from me. Maybe I've affected other people. I don't know. And he's, he's looking at Jesus. He's saying, if you are willing, because I don't think you are, you can heal me. And Jesus approaches him as all the disciples scatter behind him and go away. And he says to him, I am willing to heal you. Now, this, remember, this leper has been everywhere by himself, secluded in the shadows. And Jesus reaches out with a warm hand and touches him. He hasn't felt warmth maybe in years or the touch of another human being. And Jesus touches him even though he's declared aloud that he was unclean. And Jesus says, I am willing, it touches him and heals him. He says, go up to the priest, give the birds whatever you can. There are certain things you have to do, right? And the priest will make you ceremoniously clean again. The leprosy left this man and away he went. Now, what's the lesson for you? What's the lesson for me in this passage from Mark? What have you got within you that you think is not worthy of Jesus healing? What have you done in the past? I've done a lot of stupid things in the past. I've hurt a lot of people uh, in different ways when I was younger. And... Uh, even dumped my wife for. I knew you remember. I knew she'd remember the name. True. And why you've been with me for forty-six years? I keep asking myself. <laughs> I'm telling you. or things going on in our body in which we don't believe Jesus can heal us for. Or, or we don't believe that God is willing to forgive us or willing to heal us. Not just leprosy. Maybe it's alcohol. Maybe it's pornography. Maybe it's something else. I don't know what it could be. Maybe you've stepped out on your husband or your wife or your boyfriend or girlfriend. Maybe you've taken money that's not yours. I, I don't know what the, the issue is, but at some point, you withdraw from life. You withdraw from your spouse or your boyfriend or girlfriend. You withdraw from family because you know you've done something wrong. You know, you think to yourself, you can't be forgiven. You don't think Jesus can forgive what you did. And so you just mask it, right? You just mask it. How's everything going? Fine. Everything's good. Nothing wrong with me at all. I'm happy, right? Which is a bunch of malarkey. What you have to understand is this. Now, whether God heals you of a, a, an ailment or not that's bad, I don't know. That's, that's above my pay grade. I, I, I don't have the power to do that. Even if God came to me today and said, I will give you the power of healing people, and I would want to heal Lois right away, I would not take that power. Because then we would never be alone. People would come from all over the planet, lining up at our door, wanting to be healed. Life would be over as you know it. So I want you to think right now about yourself. I don't want you to say anything out loud. I, want, I don't want to know. What's going on in your life right now that you are pulling back from God? That you've pulled back from the Spirit of God because you've done something? Or maybe you don't think you've come far enough in your Christian walk? Or I don't know what, what there's an ailment, there's a, I don't know what it is. And you do that because you don't think that what you've done can be forgiven by God. You don't think that God is willing to do a work in your mind, in your spirit, in your body, in your soul. But Jesus says to you today, just as he said,
said to that leper thousands of years ago, I am willing. You just need to believe it. And if you understand that I'm willing and you come to me and you tell me what the issues are, I want to bring a healing into your life. When that happens, you step out of the shadows. You, you step out of your loneliness. You can join families again, join people again. You, you don't have to be guarded in what you're saying or guarded about what you're doing because you have been forgiven by God. You have been touched by Yeshua, by Jesus. And that's something we need to do. Now, you'll never see anyone running along saying, I'm an alcoholic, stay away, right? Or I beat my wife, stay away. Or I do this, or I do that. We had a foster child once that came in, and he was burnt. Lois changed his every day. Was it, was it a yellow box? It was a little yellow box with all the gauze and all the stuff. And when she pulled it out, this little boy just started crying. And he was bugging his mother, apparently. He was two years old. And she was making craft dinner. She had the water on the stove boiling. She took the pot and chucked it in his face. Burned it all the way down. Every day, Lois had to peel skin and peel off the bandages and, and put ointment and put the bandages back on. What a horrible thing to do. I doubt that that woman would walk down the street and say, I threw boiling water on my child. But she should say that to the Lord and beg for forgiveness or seek help. Right? So this is our passage today. And so ask yourself, who are the lepers among us? Not sick lepers, but who are the lepers? Who are those that have done wrong? Who are those that are hurting? Who are those that are not approaching God for asking forgiveness? Who don't think that they're worthy today, right today, don't think they're worthy of getting beyond something that they've done in their life that they think is so bad, but it's really not. All you have to do is in your prayers today or tonight or whenever is confess that to God. God, this is what I've been doing. This is what I'm struggling with. These are the things I've said or done that I shouldn't have said. These are the things that I'm, you know, addictions or whatever. And then you say to God, Lord, if you are willing, if you are willing, you can heal me. You can take this from me. You can take the burden from me, right? Whether it's physical or emotional, spiritual, uh, sickness, relationships, financial, whatever it is, Whatever it is, Jesus is saying to you right now, I am willing. All you have to do is ask. And it's his desire always to make you whole. Now, we're going to sing a, a beautiful song. It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. Give me a second, I find it here. stand if you're able. If you're not, please remain seated. Crank that puppy up. When he's like a river attended my way when so